not that he needs any kind of introduction, but Max Schrems, as you would all know, he is a titan of civil liberties and privacy advocacy, not just here in the EU, but for campaigns and judicial challenges have had impacts all over the world. But we have him for 45 minutes. <laughs> and I just stress this in terms of format, because Max and I are about to have a conversation about GDPR, about privacy rights in Europe, all over the world. But what we would like to do is to take just a few minutes, and this is why I'm being ever so slightly rude when you see me glancing down at my phone. It's because I'm just keeping an eye on time so that we can take just five minutes, so that we can just take a couple of questions from the floor just before Max has to leave us, so. And it's not because I'm that kind of important to go other places, but there's a flight waiting and I can't miss it, so that's the reason can't why we have to flight. be a bit precise with time. Exactly, yes. Thank you, Max. So, Max, a way in which you're often described is the man who took on Facebook and won. And I think I've always found that statement to be very interesting because there's a sense of finality about that. But would you say that perhaps you've won some battles, but the war continues? There was that actually just one thing where we won, and actually technically we didn't win against Facebook, but against the Irish Data Protection Commissioner for not investigating a case. Um, so the whole Safe Harbor case was only about um, the Irish DPA saying that my complaint was, what they called it, frivolous and vexatious. Um, and that was brought up to the Court of Justice that found that my legal arguments were, I guess, everything but frivolous and vexatious. Um, but that was actually the battle. So there was never really a win over Facebook, technically. And the first um, complaints we filed um, with the DPC even, I think, two, or two years earlier, in 2011, um, all of them actually took back after three years because even after three years, we didn't get the counter arguments from Facebook. We're not allowed to see any of the evidence of the procedure. There was no decision. There was like um, so-called... Um, um, audit report, but there was no decision on actually the legal questions were posed. So um, I would ever s actually say it's a, gr a tremendous overstatement to actually <laughs> say that they, I want anything. I think it's more an example of how things don't work if you want to claim your privacy rights. Um, so I think that's actually more of an example in that direction. But So you mentioned, of course, the safe harbor judgment, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but the safe harbor judgment harks back to a legal challenge that was brought by Max. It originally started off here in Ireland because most of the US multinationals have their EU headquarters here in Dublin. And as a result, the preliminary challenge began here. It ended up as a, as a successful challenge, as you mentioned, um, in front of the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is the Luxembourg Court, the highest court in the EU. And it struck down and, sat and established quite a massive precedent in terms of the EU-US data transfer regime. And this set ripples across EU law and all over the world, really, because it had a huge impact for the other data transfer regimes between the EU and other countries. But just to go back to what you mentioned in terms of that journey starting, it was when you brought a complaint, and it was 23 complaints in total, 22 at first, and then 20, 23. Yeah, 23, yeah. 23, which, which was the national which sounds, surveillance which, question. Yeah, which sounds crazy. It's an like awful we lot. We kind of put actually every button into an individual complaint so it's easier to process for the Data Protection Authority. Right. Like every, each complaint was basically just one page after all, or two pages or whatever. Um, so it's not like um, we could have just made one big Facebook complaint with all the issues in one. We, I just felt it's easier to kind of, you know, have each issue in one document so that you can deal with it separately. Um, and that was the first wave. Um, that was interesting. Basically the whole story started, I was studying in California for half a year and I did privacy law before. And we had different representatives from different companies. And this is Santa Clara. Um, that's Santa Clara, it's, uh, like in the middle of the Silicon Valley. And the interesting thing is that they didn't know a European was in the room. Um, and they were talking about European privacy stuff. And they were pretty open and upfront about the fact that, oh, we do have all these wonderful laws in Europe, but it's factually not enforced. So it's actually very effective for a company to ignore it because there's hardly any, pen uh, hardly any penalty. You can make crazy amounts of money by ignoring these laws. Um, so um, from an economic perspective, it simply made sense to ignore European fundamental rights. And I think that is what is the most important thing about anything I did is not necessarily the privacy debate. We have that all the time. All the newspapers are full of privacy debates, Cambridge Analytica, Snowden, I don't know what. 
But um, they are now. But I would, I would, I would put it to you, sir, that when you first brought those, the first wave of debates. complaints, <laughs> yeah. there were fewer debates, and yeah. you've contributed but to there being the a much big, wider the, debate now. But the big issue is actually enforceability, I think, after all, because we can have the nicest things in newspapers, have the nicest podium debates like here, or you know, in Austria, we have like all these wonderful debates where we out, we have this big outcry about all the privacy violations, and it's all bad and evil, um, and then we all go home and have a beer and felt like we did something because we talked about it. Um, I think that's the fundamental. Uh, the fundamental difference in what I did probably is to kind of go to the regulator and say, you know, I have a right here and it would be nice if you could enforce that, which is not, I mean, in, in normal law, the most normal thing you do. Just in privacy, it became a story. And I think that is telling on how unenforced privacy is because there are thousands of people that file complaints about thousands of things in Europe every day. Um, no one ever writes a newspaper article about that. It's totally irrelevant. Um, but when you do that in a privacy setting, it suddenly becomes makes you a unique person to be that one person that ever claimed his rights. And I think that is that is telling in the sense of, of where we are with the privacy debate. We're obviously at the very beginning, oftentimes compared to like the environmentalist movement in like the very beginning of the environmentalist movements where you kind of have to tell, you know, if this fish is actually dead swimming around the river, the river that's not a good idea. And you know, that's, that's kind of the level of, of what, how we deal with privacy oftentimes now. And um, we're still very much at the, this first step, I guess. And just the fact that my story was a story in any way, I think shows how much we're at the beginning of the whole debate after all. Do you think you would be sitting here today if it wasn't for Edward Snowden? Because between 2011 mm. and the Schrems challenge that went all the way to the Luxembourg court, there was a major cultural shift mm. in terms of how people talked about their privacy, talked about national surveillance. For the first time, a lot, I mean, you, yeah. any privacy advocates in the area, it was no major surprise to hear about the way data was being shared between the NSA and other oh, safe five eyes. Were you surprised? Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like the anti-conspiracy theorist. So I'm kind of, unless something is proven, I kind of assume it doesn't exist, uh, which is like very unique in the privacy world. Um, usually it's the other way around. Um, so I was actually surprised that that was happening to that extent. I mean, looking back, if you kind of look at the FISA Act, it explicitly says it in US law that it's done. So, but kind of everybody ignored it before, or I've not even really paid attention to it. And I think what you said is right. I called, um, I called um, the Snowden disclosures at a time, the Chernobyl of data protections, like that one time everything blew up and no one could really ignore it anymore. Um, and I think that was interesting. And now we have like Cambridge Analytica and so on. But it depends also on the countries. Like um, for example, in, the, in, in, in Central Europe, I would say the privacy debate has been very live and well even before Snowden. Um, for example, the whole debate um, now with Cambridge Analytica was really, to a large, ex large extent, I mean, obviously spilled over because the Facebook debate then gets into other media as well, but it was mainly a US debate, which I personally don't even think is a privacy debate. I think Cambridge Analytica in substance is a Trump debate. It's another reason why the people that hate Trump have a reason why he got elected in evil ways. First it was the Russians, then it was fake news, and now it was Cambridge Analytica that manipulated anybody. But I don't think that the people actually debating these issues are so fundamentally interested in privacy, they are fundamentally interested in having a reason why Trump got elected. Which is fine from an advocacy perspective, because if that's the reason why you care for privacy, I'm all, f I'm all for it. Um, but I don't think that this is fundamentally a privacy debate, because for example, the Cambridge Analytica situation, um, was one of the 22 complaints. Um, I filed a complaint on apps where I said at the time, these apps can pull the data from Facebook without consent of the people whose data is actually pulled, like the person that installs the apps consents, but they can pull the data of all your friends as well. And these friends have never even heard of the app that you may have installed. So if for example, the two of us would be friends on Facebook, I install an app and the app can pull your data without you even knowing about it. That's the first problem, which is legal. Um, the second thing is that this app doesn't have to have any kind of contra contractual relationship or anything with Facebook or me to make sure that this data is not used for evil purposes. Like this app could have been in North Korea if they would have internet um, and pulled the data from Europeans. We wouldn't have no possibility to, to, to make sure what happens with the data. And that's exactly what Cambridge Analytica did through that app is they pulled the data of millions of people through a couple of people filling out or using that app and it was used for purposes that were never intended and I was really word on word the complaint we filed in 2011 with the DPC in, 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 in Ireland. But it's not as if that didn't have an impact though, because you then had an audit of Facebook by the then Data Protection Commissioner, yeah. Billy Hawks, and Facebook were very much informed of that very issue, but just didn't 
act upon at it. At the time, we had we had the seven-hour meeting with Facebook in in in, our, in in Vienna at the time, and they said that there doesn't need to be consent because there's so-called third-party consent. So I consent that I. Facebook or some app can use your data without you knowing about it. That's what they call third-party consent. Third-party uh, doctrine No, it's just, in the US. No, not, not third-party doctrine. That's a different idea. The idea of them is third-party consent. I consent that I can, you can misuse the data of someone else. Um, I was like, under that doctrine, you can basically just have Zuckerberg sign it off. And then, you know, he's, he consented to them having my data. Um, long story short, um, that, was the, that was the official argument. Um, I was like, in Austria, you still have to, to study Roman law, like 2,000 year old Roman law. And I was like, like I think for 2,000 years, there's nothing like a contract to, to the downside, I don't know the English um, legal term, the contract that is like um, negative for a party that is not part of the contract. It's like one of these oldest rules, like a contract can only be negative for the parties or can, can bind the parties that are involved in the contract. Anyway, so um, that was the first argument. And the second argument was that they have one line in their, in their terms and conditions saying you're not allowed to use that data for evil purposes. And they don't even know who these apps are running. You could put up an app an anonymously without even telling who you are. But this thing should theoretically bind the, bind the evil app that is hosted in northern China, let's say. Um, and that was the argument. And I said, it's all well and good, no problem. And that was the same problem with the audit report. Um, I had very specific claims under the law. It said, this is a violation of section blah, blah, blah of the Irish Data Protection Act, which is equivalent to that and that part of the European directive. And the audit report didn't mention the law. The audit report said, it was nice to talk about Facebook to make them more aware, and they will try to kind of reevaluate what they're doing here, blah, 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 which didn't change anything. These apps were still running, and if they would have done something in 2011, Cambridge Analytica would have not happened. It, this data transfer happened three years later. Um, I mean, someone was like, I don't think the Cambridge Analytica really changed the election. I think they're massively overstated. Um, and everybody kind of accepts that they had that much of an inf influence on the US election. We don't even know if they really did. Um, but let's assume they really were the tipping point. Um, a, a friend of mine made the joke, was like, so if the DPC would have done its job in 2011, we probably wouldn't have Trump today. <laughs> and just the thought of it is kind of interesting. I don't think it's true. I don't think they really had that much of an impact. But um, these, these apps and technologies will have more and more of an impact. And then properly regulating it will have a huge impact on our society in many other aspects of the future. This is just one kind of nice example to put it forward. And, and I think that is generally what we have to ask us in Europe in general, how we approach privacy. And if it now with GDPR um, moves from a nice to have soft law, soft law less a fair do it or not f kind of thing to a serious fundamental right, which is seriously enforced. And if these authorities, and, and that's not a specific uh, Irish thing, we have that in most authorities, I think, in Europe, is that for a long while, they came around with privacy laws in the 80s. And at the time, for example, the Austrian law said it's going to be only influencing about 100 or 200 companies. Um, and it's very likely that it's going to be less companies because there's going to be more centralized data processing. And the idea that everybody's going to have a computer back home was just unthinkable at the time. Um, so the whole approach was to educate them and tell them you know, that there's privacy and that that's important and so on. And that's stuck with a lot of the authorities for a long while. And in the privacy bubble in general, this kind of soft law, less fair approach. Now, we move into an information age today where information becomes such a crucial part of our society. Like Marin mentioned, the attention economy. Right. And, and in many ways, like starting from fake news to attention to, I don't know, to advertisement, there's like hundreds of personalized pricing. You can kind of have a list that's endless. But all of that is oftentimes based on data. And um, the interesting thing is if we move towards that society now, the question arises, who has power over that information? Um, is it going to be a couple of mainly monopolies in their field um, who are going to be able to get a huge edge over everybody else, be it other businesses or customers? Um, or are we going to regulate that in a way that there's kind of a fair balance in the end, in a very abstract, cloudy way? So you and mentioned the GDPR. I'm mm. wary of time, so I should get through yeah. a few different topics and give people a chance to also answer their questions as well. So you mentioned the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the major update and reform of EU data protection law that came into effect last month on May 25th. Happy belated GDPR day, Max. <laughs> I'm sure lots of people were wishing you that. On that note, because you talked about this culture of enforcement that was somewhat lacking a number of years ago, do you think that Cambridge Analytica, those revelations, do you think that that could be a moment of truth for data protection enforcement in the EU? 
Um, I don't know if Cambridge Analytica has really a big change in that sense because mm, it was also more debated in the ang in the English speaking countries. So, uh, for example, Cambridge Analytica has less, I think, of an impact in the public debate in Austria or Germany than. than you didn't have Brexit. Yeah, and and that is really the, we have a lot of still national cultural debates, and uh, and another big important thing is a lot of privacy is very cultural, and even within Europe we have de very different feelings of what is private and not private. And um, there are many dimensions to that. We usually kind of talk about privacy and just assume it's all the same thing. But if you look at Scandinavia, for example, there is much more a transparency approach and nothing to hide approach oftentimes. Um, I, I was saying like the Austrian Catholic thing is, thing is probably we're all sinners and we all have something to hide here. Um, but and it also depends on different dimensions. So there's a standard saying of the Americans don't care for privacy much. And a typical counterexample for that to me is, for example, sexual things. We're much more open about sexuality in Austria and talking about, I don't know, uh, one night stands or whatever among friends over a beer than I would have ever experienced in the US. So there's like different dimensions of subject matters that feel private in different cultures and so on. So I think in general, that is something we'll have to look at anyways, that you know, if there is a, a situation like Brexit then suddenly um, influence on an election becomes more of a privacy issue than in another country where that is not a subject matter at the time. Um, no, I got off track. Um, with uh, GDPR, me, let, the enforcement thing. Yes, or, yes. Yeah, and I think that is the, the, the huge crucial change in GDPR is not the material law. That's basically the same since the 80s. Um, the big difference is now the penalties with the 20 million or 4% um, as, as a penalty, where, by the way, I think the 20 million as a baseline is way too high because that even applies to a single person company. But um, do you not think that data protection authorities are going to accord those sanctions appropriately. Absolutely. You're not going to hit I, I, small, I, medium I, businesses with 20 million euro I, fines. I think so, but let's say there is a DPA that goes, like these DPAs are independent. Let's say we have a very activist DPA that kind of goes beyond what is reasonable. Um, let's say a small business in Austria gets a 200,000 euro fine. It's going to be dead and bankrupt. That's 1% of the possible fine. If that is appealed in the court, the answer is going to be, you know, it's 20 million, they just did 1% of the possible fine. Can you go much lower than 1% of the possible fine? And I wonder if, at least in the Austrian system, because the judges have much less of a leeway than here, there would be a hard case for a judge to kind of overturn that finding. And that is a problem for legal certainty. That is a problem for a small business being sure that this crazy fine is not gonna become around. Because we now have to trust that the decision maker in the first instance is not overdoing it. And there's not a lot of argument if they go for, like, say, the 200,000 uh, 200, to that have that over, overturned in a second instance. Um, and I think that is a fundamental problem with GDPR in many ways is that we have a lot of legal uncertainty in it. A lot of the law is not precise, not, uh, not precise enough. And that is especially a problem for small companies because we have a huge lack of legal certainty around GDPR. Um, the background, however, is not that Brussels is evil and uh, politicians don't get it right. The background of that was lobbying. Um, the background was that a lot of the lobbying in Brussels was about watering down the law and make it, as they call it, flexible. Um, and flexible means not precise. <laughs> and, and that is usually good for big companies because they feel like, oh, we can kind of argue our way around and we have a legal team to kind of interpret one word in crazy ways. But the average company is now sitting in front of a law and if you read it the first time, even as a lawyer, I oftentimes wouldn't know where you come down on a yes or no basis in that law. And if at the same time you have 20 million as a penalty, we have a serious issue here. And that is a problem with GDPR. And there was a lot of approaches in the debate in Brussels when GDPR was drafted to have precise rules. Like for example, say we have certain types of companies that have less than let's say 100,000 data subjects and exclude them from a lot of the duties of GDPR, which I think would have been great um, because I don't care if a small company has a registry of data processing operations. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, but but small companies can be the weak, weak link in a lot of major chains mm. now. So think yeah. of the Internet of Things, think of smart houses. If you have someone who's weak on data security as one link and part of that yeah. chain, then it doesn't matter how amazing Amazon Cloud is. Yeah. It doesn't matter how secure Google is, those mammoth but that, companies. That's an interesting thing. If you change, for example, I wouldn't adapt security measurements necessarily. Um, but for example, a lot of the documentation duties that you have where I wonder if it really makes a lot of sense to have a small company sit down and make the endless list of all their private processing operations. Is that not data management? Does that not give companies of every size mm. greater responsibility to take account for 
what type of data they yeah. manage, the risks involved, the safeguards they're going to take. Yeah. Because a major problem but I think it with would be up to a company to do that or not. Like I, I'm fine if someone wants to do that list and feels that that's a great idea. But they haven't been doing it, and that's why they it's mandatory now. Yeah, but I think there, the, what's lis what's missing is a differentiation between different kind of risks. In in a way that is, there is a risk based approach in GDPR, but it's not. Um, there are no uh, red lines. Like usually we do that in all other laws that we have. For example, for accounting, you say if you have a revenue of more than, I don't know, 10 million a year, you have to have that additional accounting element in it. And then you know it's 10 million, it's a red line, you know you're above or you're not. Um, and we didn't do that with GDPR. Instead, we had like these cloudy, dependent on your risk, you have to or not. Now you're a small company and sit there and it's like, what is my risk? Like I need a lawyer to even explain to me if I fall under this law or not. Um, and I think that is a fundamental problem with GDPR. But let's get back probably to the good side of it. Um, I think the important thing is that we now have one law throughout the European Union at least, um, that we have um, the penalties. And one thing that's totally underestimated is the private cause of action. That is something that in GDPR, I think, that doesn't get enough coverage because, for example, we now have European-wide emotional damages in GDPR. So I can just say by the fact that you lost my data and it's now hosted somewhere in Russia where it shouldn't be, I have, I'm entitled to have emotional damages over the fact that my data got lost. And since these cases are usually millions of people that are involved, you have the option to have collective redress and really have enforcement in the private sector as well. Um, and I think that's very interesting because it allows an average person to actually bring a case and get something from it. Um, because so far in most countries you need to show kind of secondary harm. So the violation in your privacy itself didn't really give you any kind of damages. You had to show that you lost your job over the disclosure of your data, which you could usually not prove. Like it's impossible to prove that you actually got fired for this reason in, in, in the usual situation. And I think that is gonna be interesting for GDPR as well that we'll have options for, like we have this new NGO, it's called NOIP there is a possibility to represent people through an NGO and thereby allow them to even bring a case at a DPA. Because the average guy is not gonna be able to really properly argue a case oftentimes at a DPA. Um, and that is, that is, I think, a lot of options where we do have these enforcement possibilities now with GDPR so that there is actually a way to get your privacy after all. Because the problem is, it's nice to put stuff on the law, in, in the law, but what we wanna have is that you start your phone and you can actually choose if your data is now shared or not and your, your privacy is respected on that device. Like that's, we wanna change reality, not the law itself. And I think that is what GDPR could possibly do. And I think that's still the big question with GDPR. Um, we now have it all in law and, and we have all the craziness and outrage around it. And the big question is gonna be, is it gonna change privacy in practice or not? And I, I think the answer still remains to be seen, but so we'll just work on this. To stay <laughs> on the, the positive aspects of, of GDPR. So the fact that before you had a directive, so the was a lot more flexibility for member states throughout Europe to decide how far they would implement certain safeguards and rights and obligations. Now under the regulation, there's a lot less flexibility. And one instance of that is the power to sanction, the power of data protection authorities to sanction. So before this year, data protection authorities across the EU, they didn't all have equal power. They didn't all have the same kind of robust some Powers of them didn't even have the power to investigate, for example, which makes and it kind of laughable. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but they also didn't have the power to issue sanctions either. That's completely changed now. They all have the power to sanction. So do you think that's a major step forward, a, a revolution? Absolutely. Like we had DPAs that were will willing to do their job, but they simply weren't allowed to. Like if you as a DPA not allowed to even go to a company and say, I want to see your servers, then what are you going to do? Like you're going to send them a letter saying, I heard you do something evil. Then the company's going to get back to you and say, prove it, but you can't. <laughs> and, and, and then the whole story is done. Um, and I think that's interesting that we now have these powers. The, the big question to me is still how the culture of this enforcement is going to change. Because first of all, you need the powers to even do something, obviously. Um, and you need the resources and the personnel and so on. Um, but you can have 150 people sit around and do nothing or you can have 150 people really do proper enforcement. And that is still gonna be interesting because so far it seems like different DPAs come out at different ends of this. Like some already were pretty public in saying, we're just gonna continue as we did. We don't have the resources to really kind of go after everybody. We are probably gonna warn them the first time around that whole deal. And there are others that said, you know, now we're actually a regulator as the financial regulator, the banking regulator, I don't know. There are thousands of other regulators. Um, and will take actions just like other regulators, not go after everybody and go ballistic on stuff, um, but to properly enforce things where there's an obvious violation of the law. And I think that's gonna be interesting how that changes. And there's an additional element, and that actually came out of 
I think that that is one of the parts of GDPR that actually came out of the whole 21st to, uh, 22 complaints the first time around, is there's now this cooperation mechanism. Um, because uh, there was this fear that it goes on like that, that in the end, it's going to be two DPAs that are going to decide over that, which is Ireland and Luxembourg, because the headquarters of the companies are there. And there's now the cooperation mechanism where if I file something, I can file with the Austrian DPA. They have to cooperate with the Irish DPA and have a joint decision, which should pre put pressure on the member states where companies sit um, to enforce the law and kind of have to cooperate with the countries where the actual data subject sits and the interests sit. Sits. And that is going to be interesting how that plays out. I'm, I'm with the first four cases we filed were deliberately filed to be coordination cases. So we filed them in Hamburg, um, Austria, um, Belgium, and in France. Um, and at least three of them will be a cooperation with the Irish DPA because the companies are, have their headquarters here. And it's going to be very interesting how that plays out because so far there's, for example, the Article 29 Working Party, which is the European Data Protection Authorities together. And rumors say that oftentimes they couldn't even agree on having a joint statement on something. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to have a joint decision um, by different DPAs. Um, and that, um, I think, is still interesting to see how that culture or that dynamics are going to play out. So you've said before that you've expressed some concern about the fact that the Irish Data Protection Authority in the past was previously very much under-resourced. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to play this major, major role in terms of EU data protection law enforcement because it will be the lead supervisory authority because of US and other multinationals having their EU headquarters here. Do you feel much more encouraged in terms of how the Irish government has provided many more resources now in terms of As I said before, I mean, previously it was obvious that there was Billy Hawks, the previous commissioner, and they had like, uh, the first time I was out at that office, it's in um, Port Arlington. Yes. And over a supermarket, and I took a picture of it, and um, I took a picture of it not, it, it was laughable like as a situation in itself, but the Austrian DPA. Anyone here from Port Arlington? <laughs> right. um, Quick shout out. There was like a central supermarket, now it's a, it's a spa supermarket. Um, but like the Austrian DPA sits in the basement as well. Like he could have taken a picture, like it's a fancy building, but in the building it's actually in the basement. Um, and I think it was okay to use that picture at the time because it represented a lot of what happened behind the wall as well. They didn't have a single lawyer and not a single technician and had 20 people and were meant to regulate Google and Facebook and so on. Um, and that's, that's kind of already on the face of it not working. If you looked at the annual reports, for example, in, in Ireland, and that's, that is an element where Ireland went far beyond EU law. In Austria, we only had the right to petition the DPA, and if they didn't feel like it, they didn't have to do anything. But on Irish law, they actually have to investigate each complaint that they get. Um, unless and it's, it's frivolous a, or vexatious. Unless it's frivolous and vexatious. <laughs> um, and... Um, so they got, uh, over the years, I looked at the annual report, and it was really interesting the year that Billy Hawks came into office. Um, the, the decision numbers went dramatically down. Um, it used to be that like one third wasn't really dealt with, one third was upheld, and one third was um, uh, turned down as, as complaints. And then it went continuously over the years to be 96 to 98% of the complaints that weren't decided, even though you have a right to a decision. Um, and the, the rest was upheld or turned down. And um, a journalist from Ireland, actually from the Irish Time, investigated and felt and realized that they only counted a complaint if it, was, if it was officially stated that this is a complaint under the law. If they just emailed and complained about some company without uh, literally calling it complaint, they didn't even count it in their statistic, apparently. So the complaint number is even much higher, and the number that they didn't really de deal with was even higher than that. Lo long story short, the interesting thing is that um, for them it made sense to not do much about it. If there would have been a decision, it would have usually been appealed by a company. Um, just take, for example, the second round of the Safe Harbor case. Um, we're now back at the High Court, and it's now referred to the Court of Justice a second time. So I think it was the Irish Examiner or someone that got a Freedom of Information request from the yes. DPC on how much that cost. So just the one year in the High Court cost the Irish DPC 2 million euros in legal fees. I think the budget is like 4 or 5, 6 million, something around that area. So if one case going after Facebook costs basically a third of your budget or half of your budget or whatever it is, how many cases can you actually bring as an Irish regulator? Just without going bankrupt, <laughs> basically. And that's, that's one of the issues that the... Um, um, this the is addressed in the GDPR, though. Absolutely, If yeah. this is something that's going to be a challenge as to how the Data Protection yeah. Authority has to operate here, the government is legally required to expand her budget. But the interesting thing is since... And, and that's, again, from an Austrian perspective, the legal fees in Ireland are just insanely high. Like, uh, you can do a constitutional court case in Austria for like two or three thousand euros, just to give you a perspective. Um, and 
that is going to be in the long run a problem because as a company that has the budget, you're just going to appeal, appeal, appeal any decision from the DPA and thereby run them out of money. <laughs> like if I would be the lawyer for Facebook, I would do that. They do that right now. There was the reference to the court, uh, the court of justice and they appealed that to the Supreme Court that there shouldn't be a reference, which was like, I, I, my lawyers in Ireland take care of that part because I really, it's Irish law and procedural law I don't know about. Um, but they said there's like tons of case law that this is not possible, but they would still do it in the sake of, they probably invest a million or something in this case, just to delay the reference for half a year or a year. And if you have players like that that have so much money to just throw at you to delay you forever, it's gonna be very hard for a regulator and they have to have a lot of energy and, and really will to kind of go forward to do these cases. Um, and we have that same, in a similar way in a different, in the opposite way I had, um, that's old cases. It may, all of this, what I'm talking about is really previous situation. I don't know about the new DPA, how they gonna work in practice. Um, we'll see how, we'll just see in practice how that works out. Um, they obviously had much more staff now. They have um, the new regulator is definitely not um, not that kind of afraid to do something as as as, as it was previously. Um, but um, we had the same situation before. I was talking to a couple of lawyers that represent companies mainly at the DPA. That was again the old um, uh, regulator, and they said there are a lot of kind of arbitrary decisions against companies as well, local Irish companies, like about CCTV somewhere and stuff like that. And they said a lot of the companies didn't feel like appealing a decision by the DPA because it would cost a couple of 10,000 euros, 100,000 euros to have your kind of, I don't know, CCTV camera out there or whatever the case was. And that is generally a problem that these, um, and that's a structural problem that we have with the DPAs in general is that they um, are independent, which sounds great, but that also means that there's no um, political oversight. There's no minister responsible for that decision. There's no one that can give them orders in any way. But if the oversight system, which are the courts in this way, is so expensive that it's very unreasonable to ever complain about the decision, then you kind of have a body that can pretty arbitrarily decide either way without a lot of possibilities for anybody to really hold them to account if they decide the wrong way. And that is a structural issue we have that is a combination of this independence that comes out of EU law and these very expensive procedures in practice in Ireland. And I think that is something that's gonna be interesting how that plays out in practice. Um, so there is a major tension between the independence that data protection authorities have independently, but- And accountability to the other hand. And accountability on yeah. the other hand. But at the same time, you do have a pan EU body, the European Data Protection mm. Board, that have now been set up under the yeah. GDPR. They're now the legal form of the Article 29 Working Party, a group that has representatives of member states all over the EU and representatives from the institutions as well. Do you not think that the board is going to play a role Absolutely. in curbing yeah. back yeah. on the independence but of data of that, protection authorities? All of that, again, like, uh, so far in the paper, we know how it should work, but we don't have any practical experience on all of this yet. And that's going to be very interesting. GDPR that, is a brave new world. Absolutely. Like, you're sitting there and a lot of it. I was asking a couple of details of these cooperation mechanisms to, like, regulators. And like, that's an interesting question. We haven't even thought about that. <laughs> so a lot of these issues are going to come up in practice the first time, and we'll have to see if it works or not. Um, and even like with the, with the cooperation mechanism, let's say um, a case between Austria and Ireland would be decided in my favor as an Austrian citizen. <laughs> then um, the company would obviously have the right to appeal in Ireland as a negative decision towards them. Now, I would have to go at least an appeal stage back to Ireland and fight my case as an Austrian citizen in Ireland against the big company because I would be the other party in this situation. <laughs> Um, because, and the appeal system is not uh, centralized in Europe. The appeal system is still national because a national decision by a regulator in Ireland just simply has to be appealed in, in the Irish courts, not the Austrian ones. Um, so that's gonna be interesting how that plays out in and practice. And this is the, pr the principle of proximity that you should have effectively local redress yeah. in terms of where you are and that's true in for your companies member states. and the users. So yeah. we were actually saying, interestingly, it would be interesting for the user in this setup to lose a case the first time around because then my appeal would be in Austria, which is much cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it would be kind of interesting to kind of lose the case first time around if you think that overall you're gonna win it because to, for example, bring a case up to the Court of Justice, it would be cheaper to go through Austria, it costs probably 10,000 euros or something. <laughs> and so it you would even have an, kind of a, a, a interesting losing a case first time around in a country that is cheap in the appeals process. Which, Which is kind of really kind of, if you go through all these details, you see how, how kind of absurd things get sometimes. Um, yeah. So 
effectively welcome to the world of strategic litigation, everyone. Absolutely. And <laughs> I mean, that's exactly technically what... forum shopping, even though that's what we're meant to be countering against with yeah. GDPR. I mean, forum shopping is the negative word for strategic litigation in that sense. Um, but that's that's something we'll try to do with, with NOIB, with this organization, is to um, enforce stuff on a European level and thereby think about where to file a case where it's it's the most effective. Which doesn't mean like, you know, there is like um, forum shopping the US style, which is like thinking about which judge sits on which panel and do I know about that judge and his personal history and his kids and what he's using to kind of be super targeted. That's nothing we're going to be able to do in Europe anyways and we won't do that. Um, but for example, it is reasonable to think about if I file this case in country A, is it going to cost me 20, 30, 40,000 euro, which is still way more than any individual user would usually pay for any case like that. Or is it a country where possibly I'm slapped with a bill that's like 10 million, which would kill even an NGO? Um, and that is something we'll obviously try to, to look at whenever we file cases. There is um, a lot of other issues. We have a couple of members, we have 16 member states that have different forms of collective redress, class actions in some different ways. Um, if you file in these countries, you can collectivize these interests. Um, there are other countries where you could possibly use the, um, the possibility that's Article 80-1 that you can represent someone. So we could, as Noib, represent you, for example, against Google, whatever. Um, so this is the new that's lobbyist the new group, none of your business yeah. has been not, established. Not lobbying, we actually don't lobby at all. We don't, we just, just enforce strategic the law. litigation. We enforce the law as different. it is. We don't kind of lobby on anything we're happy enough with as it is. Um, so you're happy with GDPR? I'm reasonably happy. People will quote we, you on I'm, that. I'm, I'm, I'm as happy as an Austrian ever gets, like we're grumpy people. <laughs> 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 and, uh, um, and it's like, you know, if, if an Austrian feels really great, they're like, yeah, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, there is this option, for example, to use that to have like mass mandating. Let's say we ask 20,000 people to mandate us to represent them in the court. That would basically collectivize the claims into one NGO and that could then bring a case. And that would, for example, even be able, uh, would allow us to have type of a uh, type of like collective redress within Ireland because as far as I know Ireland doesn't have any kind of um, class action in, in the normal sense and we could use that tool from GDPR and connect it with the Irish system and that would for example talking about court costs in Austria court costs are at a certain point three percent of the of the amount you're asking for um, in Ireland it scales differently so if it's a, like a huge amount of money Austria actually gets really expensive um, and there are other countries that are more kind of basically billing by the hour um, so that's a lot of stuff we're looking into is like how can you file different things in different countries and what are the costs for it? What is, for example, after the event insurance in different member states um, in Austria, there's procedure financing to kind of finance a case like that and have someone to re kind of have like an insurance on the case to be able to even bring that without going bankrupt yourself. Um, so that is, that is all different things we're looking into and that's going to be interesting to combine that in a way that you can actually have enforceable claims. I'm to a certain extent also worried, and that's the reason why we want to do that as an NGO, that this could become a business model. There is a realistic option that in certain member states, because these things go together in certain ways, this could be something where law firms just feel like, oh, I can sue someone and make a shitload of money from it. And that is not what GDPR is meant to be. GDPR is meant to be a human right and fundamental right and so on. Um, so to a certain extent, it's also important for us to, so to say, take that market as a nonprofit that really kind of doesn't make money from it, but it enforces the law or, or uh, as a human right. Um, because there are options, for example, in Germany to really make that as a profitable business. And I don't think that that is what GDPR was meant to be. <laughs> Do you think the combination of new safeguards and rights under GDPR, like new rights such as the right to be forgotten, data portability, the new powers to fine, for example, these new rights as well, highlighting the role of civil society and being able to bring class action suits. Does that mean that the system that we currently have <laughs> is going to be less full of major whistleblowing revelations that then dictate how the law is going to move forward? Will we have fewer Christopher Wileys in terms of no, Cambridge Analytica, a, I think there's fewer still Edward Snowdens, no, and we'll, we'll need still them continue? Because one of the biggest issues in privacy cases is finding out the facts. Um, and for example, there wouldn't have been a reference by the High Court twice <coughs> in Ireland if we wouldn't have had Snowden before. If I would have just walked up and said, oh, you know, there's like this law and possibly they could do this crazy thing with it, um, an average judge would have said, you know, that's basically conspiracy, we don't know if that's true. Um, by now we had two judges looking at that, having very precise, really looked at the US law very precisely. We had all the experts and there were, very, there were two judgments and I actually think the second reference now 
is 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 of the highest quality when it comes to kind of really determining the facts bit by bit exactly how it is like, uh, which is the most important thing for us if it's a reference to the Court of Justice because the local judge in Ireland decides basically the facts and the law is then decided in Luxembourg. Um, and to have these facts that precisely is only possible if you previously have disclosures um, and, and, and whistleblowers and so on. So part of NOI, what we'll try to do is have to have like a whistleblower platform where people can dump on the page because the reality is a lot of the programmers that do these things are very unhappy about what they do because they oftentimes understand what these systems are actually able to do. Um, so you have a lot of people that work within companies that are seriously unhappy about what they did. Um, so that's a source of getting information. Again, that is an issue because that's regulated differently in e different EU member states. So in Austria, whistleblowing is basically legal in 99% of the cases. There are other countries that are much more restrictive on that, so we still have to do the research to even accept from different countries to not violate the law in the countries when we accept whistleblowing um, information. Um, but that's one of the ways to figure out what companies actually do, and that's the biggest problem in privacy in general. We know very little of what companies factually do. There are privacy policies that say, Basically, we can do anything we want to do, but um, for having a legal claim, you have to also make sure that they actually do that because you cannot have a fixtures claim about something that they theoretically could do with your data. Um, and that is why we will still need um, a lot of the factual evidence in different formats and sources. One of the options as well is um, to have DPAs figure out the facts because they now have this right to investigate. Mm. So they can actually raid a company and say, we want to have a copy of everything you store on your server. And they will then have to hand that information out and in, I had a long beef with the Irish DPA about access to my own files. I never, we never got the files. It was one of the funniest situations. I was out there in Port Arlington. And I was saying, you know, I would like to have the response to my claim from Facebook because Facebook got all my submissions. So it's in a fair trial and two-party procedure. I should usually get the other side's submissions. And the deputy DPA at, 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 D, at DPC at the time said, um, no, you don't get it. You don't get any files in this case. And I was like, that's interesting. There is Article 6, European Convention of Human Rights, fair trial. I think that should apply anywhere in the European Union. And the answer was, no, it doesn't apply to us. Yeah. I was like, so the Charter of Fundamental Rights or doesn't apply to like the DPC? And they're like, no, it doesn't. I was like, why would that be? We don't tell you. And that was the answer. <laughs> I was like, um, that was really one of these moments where I was like, am I in the European Union or somewhere else in the world? And, um, and until today, we didn't get to files. And for example, to get back to the Safe Harbor case, Actually, it turned out later. So I found that in 2013, the DPC went to Facebook and asked them about And the Facebook back then sent an email to the DPC saying, we don't use Safe Harbor, we use standard contractual clauses. We're assigned to Safe Harbor, but we don't use it in practice. The DPC never told us. So we went all the way to Luxembourg to kill Safe Harbor to only find out three years later that they didn't use that. And hence Schrems 2, and which is now the And that's the reason we're now in Schrems 2. And the basic reason is because the DPC didn't have follow its logical duty of exchanging the documents in a two-party procedure and told us that we're not allowed to know anything about it. Facebook always got everything I submitted, which is a very interesting situation. Again, you, I was in the, in the situation of suing the Irish DPC for a couple of hundred thousand euros at the high court and find some kind of you know lawyer to do all that just to get the files in my own case. And that's the reality is that um, even though you know you have these rights, enforcing them is so expensive that you just give up and kind of, you know, take the decision as it is without even knowing what the legal basis was or what the facts were before, before the DPA when making that decision. On Schrems 2 for this next judgment, do you think the Luxembourg court is going to strike down the privacy shield, which is the safe harbor replacement? Mm. Um, so that was a very interesting development in the case. Um, basically, I was amazed on how bad Facebook's representation was. Um, they had like all their senior counsel and all their craziness, um, but the, the submissions they made were a lot of American lawyers and fewer Irish lawyers. Um, yeah, I mean, the, no, the representatives here were obviously Irish. Um, as well. Um, the senior counsel and, and, and the local representatives. The most interesting thing is they had a 300-page document on um, basically that mass surveillance doesn't exist by a professor from the US that is in the privacy bubble known as kind of having that much um, relationship to the truth as Trump. <laughs> to pull it mildly, and he was like their main witness in a way. And I was looking at his report, and seriously, the first footnote was like that the European, um, that the, um, f the, the, the fundamental rights agency of the European Union would have found that there is no mass surveillance in the US. I know the guy that wrote that report, he would have never wrote that in any kind of report. So you follow the footnote and actually leads to a page where it says nothing about that. And the whole report was written like that. And it took me really seriously 15 minutes to figure out that this is gonna be shredded in pieces.
And they still submitted it. No one on the Facebook team of all the crazy lawyers that have probably got millions for this case, no one looked at that report. We obviously shredded it, especially the Irish DPC who was really well represented. Their, their senior counsel was killing this part. And um, they walked out with basically nothing. So they realized that their case is pretty much lost. So last minute around, um, the representative for Facebook pulled out the privacy shield really in their closing statement and said, but there's the privacy shield where it says US is great, so we're gonna put this forward now as well. And I was like, oh my God, why would they do that? Like they stayed away from it as long as possible because in the strategy, we would have now gone to Luxembourg only on the standard contractual clauses. We would have killed that. Then they would have pulled out the privacy shield. We would have had the second, the third round. <laughs> and, and they could have done that for probably 15 years because there would have been the next decision every time. And now the last minute they pulled out privacy shield, it became now a part of the question. We'll obviously argue that it's invalid because it is invalid on 100 reasons. Um, and that may lead them with basically nothing. Um, so that's a yes uh, we to the end of the privacy shield. I think, uh, and I'm the, cutting the you off just no, here because thing, uh, you have, have a plane correct, I have to correct, and I'm a bad I have, chair. Uh, 30 <laughs> seconds. I have to correct that it, it will depend on the judges in Luxembourg if they feel like attacking it. We will obviously claim it, but they can go around the question and say it wasn't explicitly asked if it's valid or not. That's going to be basically a decision by the judges in Luxembourg if they want to look in it. If they will look in it, I think it will die in 99%. 99% dead. Dead. Okay. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Statistically, it's more likely that I'm alive after this judgment. <laughs> <laughs> very, very quickly. Do we have any hands for some very succinct questions? Okay, I see two hands. Stand any final takers? A uh, microphone? Oh, thank oh, thanks you. very much. Uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, filmmaker and co-founder of S. Brands Productions. I have only one very brief question. Uh, first of all, I must congratulate you on outstanding work as a human rights defender in this... In this um, in this realm. I think that needs to be said. And uh, my question is very succinct. Do you think really what, we, what is needed is proper uh, antitrust legislation to break up these monopolies? Mm. Okay, I'll yeah. hold you there. Thank you very much. Great question. Can we take the other one? question I'm just going to be well? the microphone boy as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, many companies are using GDPR as an opportunity to become transparent and be fair with their co consumers about privacy. Others like um, Oath, who've just bought Yahoo, um, they are asking consumers to just agree to this new set of dubious um, requirements or you cancel your entire account and lose access to all your data. You mentioned this morning that ideally people would have the option to choo pick and choose. What can an individual do? in those situations where a company already owns huge access to their data and they're being asked a one and only, yes or no, or you lose everything? Two excellent questions. Max, can you come back to the <laughs> okay. head of the floor? <laughs> Thank you. So I think the first question is really, um, one of the things that I still care much more than privacy right now, I think that's the next upcoming big question, is how we regulate the online sphere to be fair again and the really open market. And that's the interesting thing. The internet used to be that open thing where every... You could email from, from one provider to the other. You could have any access to the internet and access any page in the world. And that was the whole mighty kind of greatness about the internet. And it was the ideal of a, of a perfect market with thousands of suppliers, so thousands of demanders, and then you have a market price and all these like wonderful ideas. On top of that infrastructure, we now have monopolies that just sit on top of it and suck it all in. And um, that's hugely problematic for, for businesses that are local that cannot compete with these international companies. Um, that's a huge problem for any kind of market theory in general, let alone privacy. Any kind of even being able to compete with, I don't know, being a local advertisement company. How are you going to compete with a global advertisement company if there's no interoperability? So I think um, the EU actually has a very great approach in interoperability to open up phone networks, telephone, um, electricity, gas networks, rail networks, anything. And I think we'll have to reintroduce that for for relevant online infrastructure, to put it that way. I don't have any precise idea on that, but for example, there is open standards for social networks. Why can't I use another social network and still communicate with the basic functions with someone that stays on Facebook? Because there are thousands of other social networks that are probably more innovative, greater, more privacy friendly, that people would like much better than Facebook, but because of the network effect, they will never move out. And um, that is something where it's typical market failure. That's like old market theory ever since and we'll only get going to be able to overcome that in a regulation. That's also one of the reasons I think why privacy is not going to work in educating people and making them more aware. Most people are aware that there's something shady going on here, but they don't really have an option to get out. Like if I want to have another, so, um, s another smartphone, I can choose between Google and Apple. 
how much of a choice do I have? Um, so I think that's that. The the other question I um, could you rephrase very very quickly? Yeah, oh, so yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. The consent fallacy. I got back, yeah. So the interesting thing is when GDPR came around, we now had all these tons of emails and pop-ups and all that, that kind of craziness. If GDPR would have been properly implemented by these companies, there shouldn't have been a pop-up, in my view. <laughs> and because 99% of what you got to do as a company is legal under GDPR anyways. Anything that's necessary to provide a contract is legal without consent, without bothering anybody. Anything that's necessary under the law, bookkeeping, for example, um, is allowed without bothering anybody, without consent. Um, we have a fundamental clash here that um, most of these companies run the California system of notice and choice, which is basically, um, they have that in many areas. Um, the typical thing I uh, compare it to is um, there is notice and choice in um, Prop 65 in, the, in California that says you have to put a notice on anything that could be um, cause cancer. Mm -hmm. So um, I was, for example, at Hertz rental cars, and my car had a big sticker on it saying, this car may cause birth defects, cancer, blah, blah, blah. And so, so that's your notice. <laughs> and then your choice is take it or leave it. Um, and that is exactly what GDPR doesn't foresee. That it basically says there's 99% of the things are legal anyways. And if you then need to use that data for secondary purposes, like advertisement or selling it off to someone else, then people actually have to have a genuine yes, no possibility without any kind of consequence to them other than this decision. So you're not allowed to couple it with, for example, a contract and say, we only provide the service if you agree. And that is explicit in GDPR. It's one of the things that GDPR is totally clear on. And all the big companies have ignored it. A lot of the big, not all, but a lot of the big companies have ignored it. That's the reason the first four complaints we filed were actually on what we called forced consent. So for example, in the case of Facebook, um, it had a pop-up saying you can either delete your account or you agree, which is not freely agreed by any means because you lose all your friends and all your connections and all of that if you don't agree here. Um, and that is one of the things where if GP GDPR is properly implemented, we should actually get rid of all of this. Um, the problem is that they still run this American approach of notice and choice and just think, get consent, get consent for anything. And this consent is usually not valid. Like if you, I usually tell people agree to it, happily agree to it, it's simply not valid anyways. <laughs> um, and I think that's, uh, that's a matter as well for enforcement after all. Like it's a very clear violation and if we can properly implement that, then we should get rid of these pop-ups and you should really have a choice in these additional things and then say I want it or not. And this will be another key litmus test for the general data protection regulation going forward to see if consent is made much more granular, to see whether you still have those locked in choices or whether it's much more open, it's much more informed, and to also see in future how that's going to affect as the question that you raise, competition law policy in Europe. And on that note, Max, I just want to thank you so much for a really fascinating discussion covering so many different topics. <laughs> Privacy Shield, GDPR, Edward Snowden revelations, Cambridge Analytica, the clash between US privacy law culture and the EU culture. And I suppose most importantly, to see how effective GDPR is actually in future. Please join me in thanking Max. Thanks a lot. <laughs>